Can you imagine on a Sunday morning when they tell me the 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated, and it was in the city of Birmingham, most segregated hour in the city of Birmingham. You were not going to have blacks and whites, browns, whoever come together, no matter what denomination they were, in this city of Birmingham, Alabama, to listen to the word of God. Senior, and uh, I was born in uh, Boxside, Arkansas, on June the 26th, 1940. I was born into uh, Southern culture as a white Southern male, and uh, grew up with that understanding and all that that entails. And of course, I just thought that's the way the world ought to be, <laughs> and uh, that uh, it was set up all right, and uh, that was fine with me, and. Never did have anything to challenge that at all. Was taught to me on my mother's knee and uh, by the preacher in the pulpit and uh, by the stories my daddy told at the dinner table. And one particular one stood out with a great deal of clarity. My dad uh, was talked about a story in his early experience that I guess his dad had told him, and there was a African American who was appointed by the president or the government to be the postmaster in Princeton, Arkansas during those times. And my dad would always tell the story about that African American who was appointed, and that if he had ever put the key in the door of that post office, that he would have been shot because his place was not to be postmaster in the post office. And then he would go on about how wise this African American was about understanding his true place in the world and that he was not to be in those kind of relationships and was not qualified to do that because he was black. And I guess I heard that story. I can't, can't tell you how many times I heard that story at the dinner table when issues with race would come up. That was the paradigm my dad would tell me to confirm how the hierarchy and privilege of the white male was maintained and should be maintained and that's the way things are and the way things ought to be. parsonage and Nancy wanted something from the store. Well, there's a, a grocery store across the street. And uh, so I headed out across the street to the grocery store <laughs> to get whatever she wanted. And of course, I came to uh, McCoy out of a real intense joy and excitement about church growth in those days. You know, building numbers, which is the focus of the church all the time, trying to save itself instead of <laughs> saving, you know, caring for everybody. But, and, uh, but I learned all those principles quite well. And as I was coming down the steps and down the walk over across 8th Avenue in the middle of 8th Avenue, I saw this uh, moving van backed up uh, to the Blackstone Apartments. They're not there anymore, they've been turned down, but at the time, and of course, one of the principles of church growth, you see anybody in transition, they're a candidate for church membership. You need to invite them to church. Well, 
when I looked, got in the middle of 8th Avenue and looked over there, got ready to invite those folks to church, they were black. And so I came face to face with my history and with my experience and my struggles about all of this racial inclusiveness stuff, and I was not able to invite them to church. So I was paralyzed there in the road, you know, in a sense of God asking me to invite them to church, but I just couldn't do it. I don't know how long I was there in the middle of the road. It was a very uh, difficult struggle. And uh, I was just paralyzed. The cars going boom <laughs> on both sides of the turn lane. And uh, finally I had a sense of God uh, saying to me, Lawton, if you can't invite those folks to church, I can't use you in Birmingham. To go back across the street, <laughs> pack your stuff, and leave. Well, I was too ashamed. <laughs> to go back, pack my stuff and leave and say I didn't want to be involved in ministry there. And so I reluctantly went across the street uh, and invited them to church. And of course, they knew my reluctance. They could feel that. You know, you can tell whether your people are sincere and whether you're talk, inviting them or caring for them. They didn't come to church. Uh, but it was in that moment, you know, that I became a recovering racist. <laughs> I discovered my racial attitudes and I, and I understood that they were inconsistent with the scripture and I understood the contemporary implications of that through my encounter with Martin King at seminary. And so on that day, I, I took the first step in, in my recovery. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for that. It was an awesome gift. And uh, began working to do all that I could do to build racially inclusive congregations and to work around the issues of social justice and community. When I think about recovering racist, I think about a whole series of categories, like for instance, conscious racist who repent of racism and recover from it. I think of people who don't even know they're racist, they're just imprinted by their culture. They grew up Southern, they grew up in Alabama, they grew up in a Southern Baptist church. And it's just sort of like their mother's milk. It just flows in from the culture all around them. And uh, then there are, I think, you know, bitter, violent, a hardcore racist who really see blacks as a job threat, as a competitor for space and for resources within a very limited world within working class culture. And certainly in my family growing up in Alabama, uh, I sort of had the whole range of race in the family, uh, like most Alabama families do. Uh, for myself, uh, I never really considered myself a racist, but then most racists don't consider themselves racist. If um Anyone had, had told me early on uh, when I had entered ministry and uh, was going to be a, a part of the church that I was a racist person, uh, I wouldn't even know what they were talking about. I think the term racist often um, is interpreted to be violent or threatening, an active, hostile, destructive, uh, violence against other people and I wasn't you know I, I didn't participate in that I've always been a kind person but it wasn't about whether I was kind or whether I was mean <laughs> it's about a system that benefited me uh, because uh, I was a male and I was white and I was uh, privileged in that system to have access to resources and relationships that uh, people of color uh, couldn't even imagine. <laughs>